So, just to recap, we've done swimming birds, wading birds, raptors, songbirds, mammals, insects, tossed in a few reptiles here or there. Um, so today, the last thing I'm going to do is plants. Now, obviously, there's way too many plants to do for one talk, and frankly, I I get attracted to certain plants as I'm going along based on the way they look. And so I only cover a few, I only cover the ones that sort of are appealing to me. And so if you're a real plant expert, you're gonna go, ah, what about that plant? What about that plant? You know, <laughs> you know I mean, there's literally uh, hundreds that we could do. And, I, and so I have to keep it to uh, just the flashy ones. Unfortunately, I just realized watching that movie, I forgot to put the swamp hibiscus in there, but you got to see it at least in the movie. <laughs> Yeah, they're all over the place. I mean, you can just do a panorama and it's nothing but swamp hibiscus, you know. What color is the wasp? Is it the pink? The pink, or white, the, you know, the red, they're, and they're big. I mean, they're like, you know, that, that big. Uh, they may be in the background of some of these pictures, so maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe you'll still be able to see them. So I'm going to start with uh, underwater plants. And unfortunately, I don't know very many underwater plants. And I haven't made much of an effort to, to learn about them. So I'm just going to do the one that's kind of the flashy one that everybody kind of likes. When you're out in the sun, the fan where it really catches the sun. And it's got that kind of you know uh, brilliant greenish yellow look to it. Uh, and so it's kind of nice in certain settings, but uh, unfortunately it is an invasive plant. And so, you know, like in some of the areas, it can get quite overgrown and make it difficult uh, on the flow of the water. And, you know, people that are trying to uh, kayak or, or boat or something, you know, can be a problem for them. Uh, it, it does grow from rhizomes, which you'll find a lot of these uh, Underwater and shallow water plants have rhizomes, which are, which are like big fat roots that go this way instead of this way. And so they go like this, and then, you know, this, the stems will come out from the side, and then every once in a while they'll send down little roots that, you know, sort of keep them in the, in the sediment. But they're easily uh, uh, disrupted from the, set, set the sediment. Uh, like if you get a lot of... Um, high water or storms or something, you'll see they'll get pulled up. But 
but that actually doesn't bother the plant because <laughs> they'll just reroot <laughs> from the ones that get pulled up, and so they can be quite uh, they can be quite an invasive plant. Um, you know, I, I only see these fan warts way in the back channels, uh, the small ponds and back channel areas. And one animal that does eat them is, is a carp. And you do see some big carp back there. So uh, it's helping at least one animal. Now, I don't really have any other underwater plants to show you. So I'm just going to show you. This is the other thing about the fan wart. You know, they put up this little itty bitty flower, which kind of looks bigger because this <laughs> this damselfly uh, is newly emerged, so it's actually quite small. But that flower is only, you know, maybe that big. Uh, and it just pops up out of the water. And you'll see those periodically as you're going along. And this one also has a little fly on it. I, I believe the flies can um, poll uh, pollinate these. Uh, and while the carp will eat the fanwort, it's not like their preferred food. <laughs> So I'm gonna to go to floating plants because there's a lot more interesting floating plants and you may not agree that the first one I'm gonna show you is terribly interesting, but there are two kinds of pond weed I see out there. And you know, you'll know you probably see these uh, periodically and if you have ponds near your house or very slow running water. This one, uh, this one I believe is the, um, the floating leaf pond weed. Uh, pond weed which they're both, uh, I don't know if I can pronounce this genus name, but it's Potamogeton. Uh, this one's Natanz. Uh, here's a video. I, I'm going a little fast in a couple of these videos, but that's what they look like in a, you know, you can see it's not, it's not overwhelming, but they'll, they'll make patches, but they're not heavy patches. Uh, and again, those will be in very slow moving. They'll be off to the side in little, little inlet areas or way in the back uh, back channels. Uh, this is the same one. And then the uh, next one I'm going to show you is this is the American pond weed, so, or it could be the longleaf. I'm not sure which. Uh, they both look very similar. Uh, this one, again, I see in the back channels. But here, when it actually starts forming, you can see it, it can form them quite a mess. And you can see it has these long, long stems uh, and really uh, can make a heavy population of them in one little spot. Uh, a little fast, sorry. I hope it's not dizzying. <laughs> So they're they're not very uh, ostentatious. <laughs> they're kind of just like what they look there. They're kind of green, maybe a little white. Maybe the green is because they're because they're not fully ripe, but they don't get very colorful. Um, so this, you know, they're saying that this can provide food and and uh, cover for wildlife, but I'm not really sure to what extent and which, which animals use it or eat it. Um, so duckweed, this is an interesting one. This, like this plant right here, this is a blow up. That plant is, you know, like that size. <laughs> so when it's all together, it looks like this, but, but each, each little leaf here is teeny, teeny, teeny. And underneath that leaf is just teeny little kind of root that sticks down. I mean, it's not really a root because it doesn't go into the, but it, it just sort of floats. This is, these are just floating plants. They can be a real pain uh, for, like if you're a kayaker or something. Uh, when, the, when the weather gets sort of dry and the water level goes down and it's really sunny and there's not much current, they can really build up and uh, you end up with, this is, this is like a small patch that you'd, you'd likely see, like in this particular case. I'm going to run this back just for uh, clarity here. Oh, maybe it won't, it won't let me run it back. But this is one of the lagoons late in the spring. And so you can see uh, if, it's, if it's almost non-moving water, it can be quite bad. But as soon as it rains, boom, it's all gone. <laughs> because it just gets washed down downstream uh, quite easily. Now, it is apparently like a super high protein food source. So it's like good for 
uh, for the, you know, the waterfowl and fish, uh, but it's kind of a pain for a kayak. <laughs> uh, also, they say this, this can be a food source for humans. They say it's got more protein than soybeans. Pretty interesting. Um, now, it, the one thing they do say about some of these floating plants, and this one included, especially when they form masses, they don't necessarily have to form this big a mass, but kind of like the one I showed you in the video just prior, they can form uh, like a shade area for like frogs and, and fish and stuff. But, the, but more importantly, it apparently keeps the algae down. So that's pretty good because algae actually sometimes can be even worse than this if, if you like being out in the water. Now, for the, for the floating plants you're probably more interested in, uh, of course we have two, oh, and by the way, the, um, the duckweed is a native plant, as were the pond weeds. So far, the ones I've shown you, the only one that's really been an invasive introduction was the uh, fanwort. So these are also native. Uh, this is the yellow pond lily, yellow water lily. Um, it's been uh, it's been around obviously for a long time in, in North America. Um, again, same things I described before. It's it's all in the back channels, slow moving water. You'll see them in the regular channels, but off in little you know side areas where they just don't get much flow uh, because they can't really tolerate a lot of um, a strong current. Um, they same as the Duckweed, they can provide like a shade and protect the animals underneath from too much algal growth. Um, and these are the, these, I think I, sh well, I showed in one of my posts last year, the rhizomes, they can be huge. I mean, they're like this big around some of them. And, and after like these storms and they kind of get broken up, you can see some of them floating in the shallow ponds and they're, uh, so because of the rhizomes, they will again form groupings. And in most cases, it's not a big deal. Like, like we have some sections of our river where, or the ponds where, you know, they can get a pretty good amount of it, but not too bad. But I've seen some ponds that it seems almost like they're waterlocked locked ponds that are literally just a solid sheet of, of these um, lily pot, the pond uh, leaves. Just a solid sheet of them. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know if uh, I I go to a vet over the shepherd vet. I don't know if any of you know that, but there's that road that goes to shepherd veterinary that comes right out where where Route 111 and and 495 meet. I don't know if you ever go in that section. There's that road that that kind of parallels it, uh, and there's a pond in there if you want to go see one where it is nothing. But lily, and it's a huge pond, huge, and it is solid lily pads, solid. Uh, but we don't really seem to have that. And again, I think that's because we have current and stuff, and I think that's more of a water, like a water locked area. Um, and interestingly enough, most of this is edible for human. <laughs> I don't know anybody that eats them, but. Uh, native people uh, used to use them for uh, medicinal, like apparently as analgesics and, um, and uh, anticonvulsants. Uh, the ducks will eat their seeds and the, the leaves and those rhizomes will be eaten by, you know, deer, muskrats, beavers, uh, some other rodents. If you remember, the beaver, biggest rodent in the, U in the North America. Uh, second biggest in the world, only behind the, whatever, capybara or whatever the, forgot what the biggest, I think it's capybara. Uh, okay, so, hold on a second, I think I skipped the page here. No, maybe not. Okay, so this is like what it will look like in the back channels. So you can see you get a fair number, uh, but not unreasonable, not out of hand. Um, this one's a little slower, a little easier to watch. <laughs> uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about the, the levels of plants. Like it, they're very distinctive how you see the plants. Now, the reason I'm showing you this video is because early in the life of, well, not the life, but the, the, as the shoots come up, in, like in the spring, oftentimes you'll see these red lily 
uh, lily pad, uh, and you'll think, what is that? Is that like a different? It's the same, you know, yellow and and uh, white lily pads or lily plants, but this is what when they're first growing, they can be red, and then they'll turn green as they go along. So this is the, called the fragrant pond lily, which, or the white pond lily. You've, you've all seen those. This is everybody's favorite because they're so gorgeous when they <laughs> open up. Um, almost everything about the yellow lily pretty much applies to the white lily. They are native, um, native plants. They do grow from rhizomes. You can see that when you have a patch of them, they can be quite thick, but the patches don't tend to be too big along our river. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to everybody's least favorite plant. So the water chestnut is, a, is an invasive plant that was introduced and it, one of these plants can lead to anywhere from 120 to 300 new plants. So, and this is, this is basically, well, when you first, if you first spot one, actually what you'll see is something about that big underwater. And then when it finally makes its way up to be a floating plant, this is a fairly small one. Uh, I go, when I go out, I, I look in this certain area of the back of the big pond, which is where I tend to see them. And I try to pull them up all the time. So it's not really a problem in, in that area because I keep them pulled, but I've seen other places where they're not getting managed. And you know, some people will pull up ones that are this single plant that's that big, whereas the ones I'm pulling up are like this big. Um, How do you dispose of them? Well, you try to dispose of them as far off, the, <laughs> far away from the water as you can, because unfortunately they, the, the nut can live. So um, as long as you dispose it in a place where it's not going to wash back in and it'll dry out, you should be fine. Uh, but here's the problem with them. So you want to pull them up if you can all the way. And as the year goes, like, like in the spring, I'm usually like really successful and I'm feeling really good about myself. And then as the year goes on, I'm less and less successful. Every time I pull one up, it breaks. So what is the, why does it break? This is why it breaks. That's the nut. So it's like a little anchor that sits in the, not only in the sediment, but in the plants that are growing down in the sediment. And so when you're trying to pull it, you, you're trying to pull it real slowly. The most successful, you'll pull a whole bunch of other little plants out with it, but that's fine because the nut will come with it. But mo most of the time it'll just break off and the nut's still down in there. And then you're worried that, you know, it's just going to grow another plant. But like I said, in my area, I'm keeping it under control. So it's not, it's not really a problem, but and, and the funny backstory about this nut, uh, this, I didn't get this from our river. I got this when I was like 10 years old and on a field trip. <laughs> and I held on to it all this time. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so these are the, sh I'm gonna start talking about the shallow water plants. Um, and remember, uh, the things I'm saying here, I'm not an expert in any of this. Maybe some of you even know more, so shout it out if you do. Uh, and I'm not covering all the plants. I'm just giving you some. This, by far, is the most common plant out there. It's the most dominant plant, the most common plant. This is early in the spring, one of the first plants to come up called Arrow Arum. This is when it's just starting, so you can see it's not, there's not much to see there. This is the, the leaves just starting to form. Um, The uh, arrow arum, by the way, uh, so, so again, this, this, this occurs in very shallow water, slow moving usually, although it will be in all the channels. So, so even the big, wide, fast moving channels, you'll have it, it'll just be off to the side, whereas you won't have some of those other ones I was showing because they really can't tolerate any kind of current. Uh, this one can. Um, the, this is what it looks like when it gets bigger. Now I'm going to come back to this because the leaves are, can be uh, difficult to distinguish, especially if you're going out there for the first few times and you know, you're, even me, sometimes I'm out there and I'm like, oh, I got to remember this, is that, uh, 
So we'll come back to this, but there are some characteristics of that leaf that I want to point out when we come back. Um, by the way, native people use this. Uh, here, I'm just showing you another one early in the spring. This is, this is, I'm trying to show you this because you can see the big uh, populations of them that you can get, but you can also see that they're only just starting to come out. If this was later in the year, this would be all full like with the leaves, you know. Um, the native people used to use this as a food source, but this, is, this one's a tricky one because apparently this, it's like an astringent in there that you, you can't tolerate eating it, but there's a certain way you can cook it where you have to boil it for like at least nine hours. And once you do that, you can then process it for bread or soup or something like that. And I think I read somewhere that they would sometimes like put them underground, you know, kind of like, you, know, you ever see people who do like the pig where they, they put it in the ground with coals or something? I think they might have done something like that so that they could just walk away, you know, and, and let it cook or something. But you, you definitely have to process this or, or it's not tolerable. But if you do process it, it can be a, a food source. Um, and is that invasive, this plant invasive? No, this is natural. Okay. Native plant. Um, you know, it, it's a funny thing though. We, we talk about invasive and we talk, if something's native, we sometimes say, oh, well then it's not invasive. And if somebody else brings it in and it grows really well, oh, it's invasive, it's terrible. Well, if you go down the river, this thing is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> choking out everything, you know, <laughs> but because it's natural, I mean, because it's native, uh, other things have learned to live with it, and so, you know, it's not considered invasive per se, but I got to tell you, it's, it's a very dominant plant along the, along the river. And this has a white flower, right? No, so this plant has a very inconspicuous, you, you wouldn't, you can't even see the flower on this one. You wouldn't even know there's a flower there. And I'm going to get to that because that's again how we're going to distinguish these different, uh, these different ones. So the Aero Arum does not really have a conspicuous flower that you'd be able to see. But what it does have that's different from the others are these seed pods. So coming out of the base of the plant are these like stems that kind of curl down and drop back into the water. And this is, this is a seed pod. You know, if we crack that open, we, it'd be full of seeds. You don't see that with the other two I'm going to talk about. So let's go to the, to the arrowhead. Oh, and by the way, with the arrow arum, they, uh, you know, the fruits and, and seeds can be eaten by wild, uh, wild waterfowl and birds. Um, and as far as I know, there's no, nobody's talked about any medicinal uh, uses for the arrow arum. Now this is called the arrow head. So you can see, uh, at first glance, it's quite similar. Uh, this is also called duck potato, and ducks do eat some of the parts of this uh, plant. Uh, you know, you can see differences obviously right away, but when you're going down the river and you see this one, you see the arrow arum, they look pretty pretty similar. Um, and we'll po I'll point out the differences in a minute. Uh, this too, also native. And the next one I'm going to talk about, also native. So they're all native plants and they're all quite dominant. This one, not so much as the other two. Um, so like I said, the ducks will eat the seeds. Um, sometimes the roots will be eaten, but not much uh, by the ducks. But the uh, beavers and muskrats will eat all of this plant. Um, and, you know, I think we, we, if you recall, we said beavers and muskrats are all herbivores. So they, uh, this is one of the ones they do like. Uh, humans, there's no, no, I don't know of any human eating uh, any of these parts. Um, but here is your flower. <laughs> so this, oh, wait a minute, I just wanted to show you before that. So this is uh, sometimes called the uh, broadleaf arrowhead. There are also versions, you know, that are the narrow leaf arrowhead, but they're basically still the same. You'll still see them all together and you'll see both of them with the flowers. So here's the white flower and this one's quite conspicuous. In fact, this month, uh, mostly the previous few, I'm, I'm sure if you went out there today, you'd still see a lot of them, but um, 
it's starting about a month ago, they just started coming up and then maybe two weeks ago, you just, you see a lot of these along there. Now it's not, it's not like a hibiscus where they're everywhere, but, but you'll see little patches of five or six of them and then you'll go down a ways and see a few more. Um, they're much more uh, conspicuous and they do have a lot of pollinators, uh, mostly uh, bees and flies I've seen on these. Um, I haven't seen any butterflies on these. There you see a honeybee, the other one was a, was a bumblebee. Um, I tried to put more movies in the plants because, you know, <laughs> plants, I mean, what are you gonna do, so. <laughs> and again, here you see a really good example of the arrowhead leaf with the, with the uh, flowers. We'll talk about the other plant in a minute. Okay, so this is the third of the three that I wanted to talk about together. So now, uh, going back to the arrow arum, very much in the shallow water. The pickerel weed, very much in the shallow water. The arrowhead, I feel like it's usually back a, a little bit. I mean, it's still a wet, swampy area, but it's more almost like a shore plant. It's, it's in among the grasses, uh, whereas both the pickerel weed and the arrow arum you'll see out into the water, especially the pickerel weed. That'll really come out. If, in fact, if, if we looked at kind of a layering, you'd see usually pickerel weed first, behind it would be arrow arum, and then maybe you'd start seeing the grasses and there would be the, the broadhead and a bunch of other, uh, I mean the arrowhead and a bunch of the others. Uh, so this is early spring pickerel weed. It's just starting to come out. And this is what it starts looking like when it's a little more um, a little more established during the year, later in the spring. Has the, one of the best flowers out there in the, in the river. This one might be a little fast, if you've taken your Dramamine. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to show you how dense these, um, and so again, this is what I was trying to say. This is a native plant. Nobody complains about the picker weed, but look at how much <laughs> it grows. Uh, very dense stands of picker weed. And you will see these, especially early in the spring, you'll see these eaten way down. And I think it's the geese, but it could be, I don't know, it could be a lot of them, but they get way eaten down. So I'm gonna show you some uh, videos. This is slow-mo. If you look at the one on the left that's moving, you see the very small bee, not the bee, not the bumblebee, but you see the little bee? Yeah. Yeah. Now that's the one I talked to you about during the insect talk that's called the Dufaria. It's a, it's a, Another solitary bee that, that makes its uh, nest near pickerel weed. And pickerel weed is its only source of pollen. It doesn't use any other pollen, just pickerel weed. And again, you'll see it in some of these too. The one on the left, when it goes, uh, it'll be slow motion and it'll I think this is the one that I use to show you how many. Watch once it goes into slow-mo. Now watch, it's a little hard to see because it's only half screen, but watch how many you'll see come into the screen. There'll be like a dozen at one point. Um, and the only way you'd see this is, is me slow-moing it, otherwise they'd just be flashing across the screen. But look at them all right in there. That's all one type of bee, a specific type of bee that only uses pickerel weed as its source of pollen. And uh, I think when I gave you the insect talk, I showed you a close up of it, but I don't have any of them here since this isn't an insect talk. Uh, now this is interesting. So we talked about in during the insect talk, this, of course, is an adult dragonfly. If you look in this picture here, it's a little hard to see because these are small, but this is the uh, larval dragonfly will crawl up the stem, usually of a pickerel weed or a arrow arum, and it, most of the time, I, you might see it on the stem itself, most of the time I see it on the back of the leaf, and it will, go through its metamorphosis there and, and become the adult and leave behind its dried husk. 
This is the first time I've ever seen one that actually came up on the flower to, to emerge as an adult. So that's just a dried husk of what was an immature dragonfly before it became an adult. I think that's the first time I've ever seen that out on the flower itself. Okay, now, this is how you're gonna tell the difference. If you, if you get confused between these three while you're, you're kayaking down the river, this is called pinnate venation. So the veins, notice there's a central vein, and all these veins come out and go to the edge off the central vein. That's called pinnate in venation. This one's called palmate in venation. Notice they all come out from the, from the base, and they all go to the edge in kind of a radial fashion. So very different, even though they kind of look superficially similar. The other thing that they point out is that these have very pointy uh, tips. These, while they kind of look pointy, they're a little more rounded. Sorry if I'm in your way. <laughs> um, it, that's a little harder to see, but, but the, the veins you can clearly see. And this, you know, these aren't as obvious when you're cruising along, but these can be quite obvious. Uh, so you'll know when you see that if you look at that kind of radial veins. Notice the pickerel weed, and this is a gorgeous leaf. I can't believe I got this leaf, almost a perfect leaf. Um, notice that they seem to come out also mostly from the base, although not exclusively, but they don't radiate. They, they circle around and come all the way back up and go to the, go to the tip. You see how that's, it, it comes, instead of here where it just goes straight to the edges, this one comes around, circles, and comes up. And you see some of them coming out of the center going up too. Now, the pickerelweed leaf shape is so much different than these two that it's probably, you should be able to just spot that. But I'm just saying, because these are the three dominant sort of plants that you'll see all together, and they will be all in the same areas. Uh, and as I said, I think if you, if you came up to a place on the shore where you're seeing all three of these plants, you're likely to see this, the pickerel weed, furthest out, and then the <coughs> arrow, arum kind of in behind it, and then notice, see how this is always kind of in the grasses? Whereas here, you'll always see water down here. It's in, it's in water. Uh, usually a few inches deep, up to maybe, you know, a foot deep. Okay, another shallow water plant. Oh, by the way, so the pickerel weed, I should probably tell you, that also is fully edible for humans. <laughs> I don't know if any of you want to eat pickerel weed, but you, uh, you can. And, uh, you know, ducks will eat it, waterfowl, deer, muskrat, beavers, they, they all love the pickerel weed. Um, okay, and we talked about the leaves. So the yellow flag, okay, now we're back to an invasive plant. Um, this one was introduced for obvious reasons you'll see in the in the coming slides it's decorative it's you know people want irises obviously um but it it is it can get a hold and really make big stands and choke out native plants and so you know again there's there's reasons why it's invasive but it's also very attractive so it's kind of a bit of a dilemma there although they do say it can sometimes clog up rivers and stuff this is this is the iris just coming out in the spring and this is an example of how they don't have to be out in the sun this is this is quite a shaded area i have a, a, a bunch of them back in a very shaded area um, and here they are uh, starting to bloom this one you can see are in sunny areas especially the one on the left that's quite a sunny spot we didn't have much sun this spring, so if it doesn't look sunny, that's why. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, you're all familiar with irises, and these are, give quite a splash of color to the river when it's their time. They also have a super high rate of nectar production. Uh, you know, there's not that many flowers, and it's not that dense, so it, it, there are other plants that have a higher, you know, nectar to square foot area or whatever, but this is super high production within a flower. Um, and also they say, you know, as much as they say, oh, this isn't good for the water, uh, 
they can take up a lot of nutrients. So if we have, a, you know, like if we're polluting the water with, with certain types of nutrients, these can actually take take a, up a high amount of those. So it's kind of like a water filtration uh, system. Now, the roots and leaves are poisonous. And there's quite a few poisonous plants out here. We'll, we'll talk about them. And this is just one of my favorite slides. As you, some of you might have seen this post that I put up, but you know, this is nature finding its way, filling niches. Mm -hmm. So you've got this dead tree that fell into the water and over, over time it's starting to rot and it's gathering uh, organic material every time the water flows over it and stuff. And so the iris is actually growing out of the, out of the log that fell into the water. All right, now I do not know much about grasses, but man, this year was a heck of a year for grasses. But look at all the seeds formation. I, again, I'm assuming it's because of the rain or lack of sun or something. I don't know what, I mean, look at how nasty the weather looks out there, but those grasses are gorgeous. Uh, and I don't even know what kind of grass that is. I'm not a, a grass expert, but look at the seed production it was getting this year. Um, so this grass grabs my attention every time, and I believe this is called a coastal barnyard or Walter's barnyard, it's the same, same plant. I, I think that's what this is, but I love the, the way the, the seeds form, and they're quite colorful too. They really grab your attention as compared with sort of the duller grasses out there. Like look at that one on the right, uh, the way the sun is catching it and everything. So another one that caught my attention, and I only see it in this one spot, but it's a, it's a, a reed, um, reed grass. This is like 10 feet tall, I mean, it's huge. But it's only this one stand I see. But again, it has a very uh, distinctive uh, flowering portion of it that I really like. Um, now, this one's pretty interesting, and this one, um, actually is a food stuff. I mean, again, native people would, would uh, collect these. Uh, the, it's, it's called Indian rice. It's like a wild rice. Um, it's not technically a rice. I think it's technically a grass. Uh, but those seeds are edible just like a rice would be. And, you know, they can uh, make bread out of them and things like that. Um, they're in, again, very shallow moving water. Occasionally you'll see them up a little bit on the banks, but usually if it's, I think that's probably a very soggy area because like rice, I think they pretty much need that kind of uh, shallow water. Um, and they can easily be pulled out. So it's kind of interesting uh, when you go in the back channels, again, when the water levels go low, it gets very overgrown. So you got this, you're working against two things. The water's going down, which makes it very unnavigable. And then you've got all this grass growth and these wild rice uh, growing in there, which makes it quite difficult. And, and I think I posted the other day, I don't know if any of you saw it, but I, you know, I would bowl my way through some of this wild rice. I'll show you in a minute the, the stands of them. Although I don't have the really thick stands, but... Um, is that you beeping? <laughs> no. I keep hearing beeping sounds. No, that's oh, that's, me. I'm gonna oh, okay. I thought I did. Sorry. So when I bowl through it, I get covered with all these insects, and I caught a couple of them. And there's like little tiny yellow leaf hoppers. Kind of interesting. They're they're bouncing all over me. Uh, so ducks, geese, muskrat, they all eat these. Now this is an example of the back channel. Only sometimes. It, so here you can see you got lily ponds, you got pickerel weed, you got the wild rice. Sometimes this wild rice will just fill this. It's like, like, well, back here, this is actually a little bit of land here, but if we went around the corner, uh, sometimes it's just solid like this. And if the water, if, if that grows, and then all of a sudden like a storm comes in and the water level rises up, a lot of that gets pulled out by its roots. So it's a little bit fragile in terms of its ability to, so here, okay, now we'll get to see the, by just by mistake, you got to see the uh, hibiscus there. Um, but this is the wild, this is the Indian rice here, and you can see again, uh, the water 
level goes to here, and then we start to get some grasses and it's here, but I suspect a lot of this is very waterlogged. Um, let's just go back, since you're not gonna get to see the hibiscus. Oh, I can't go back, can I, on this? I'd have to get out of there. All right, well, anyhow, you got to see it for a second. <laughs> Uh, okay, so also back in the shallow waters, you'll see this burr reed. I don't see it very often, you know, it's just it's here or there. Uh, you don't see like big stands of it, or at least I don't see the flowering part, so that's the only way I can recognize it. I wouldn't know the leaves, you know, if I saw them without the, without the flowering part in them. Um, And those, again, can be food for, for the waterfowl, the, the burr reed. Interestingly enough, they don't really look very edible, but... Uh, and this one I really like, the bulrush. I see, again, bu uh, the bulrush, the Indian rice, the, the burr reed, all those are all native plants. So these are all normal plants you would see for hundreds of years here. Um, these you can actually end up seeing um, not big stands, but you can see, you know, areas that are several feet, maybe, you know, 10 feet by 10 feet full of those, which is kind of fun because uh, they're a little different. They're not uh, technically a, a grass. They're technically a sedge, which is a little bit different than a grass. Um, these are edible for humans. Again, don't know anybody who wants to eat them, but I'm sure there must be people who do. And of course, eaten by waterfowl. Um, uh, geese and muskrats also will even eat their, the rhizomes of these plants. So these are the, all the ones that are kind of uh, shallow water, except for those first grasses I showed, but I wanted to show those with the other grasses. Um, now is the um, riverbank plants. So uh, purple loosestrife, this is, this is an invasive plant brought over, again, for obvious reasons. Usually, usually things that are invasive, if they're not accidental, you know why they're brought over, because they're usually some kind of fancy thing that somebody wanted in, from the old world. Uh, so purple loosestrife is quite striking. Um, You'll see it. it, it can form big, heavy, thick stands, again, choking out some of the native plants. But the one thing about the purple loosestrife, you know, one of the things I pointed out about the water chestnut is that it basically has no nutritional value, so nothing eats it. So, of course, it, it you know, goes, grows like crazy. The good thing about purple loosestrife is there are some beetles uh, that uh, will, um, can keep it in check, so they can do biological control if they, you know, feel the need. Um, great butterfly and bee pollination for that one, you know, and like I said, the insects, there are some insects that can use it as food, um, but I get some great, uh, great insect pollination movies from this. There you can see a little skipper, this little guy. I don't have any slow-mos on these. <laughs> okay. The milkweed. Uh, milkweeds, uh, unlike some of these other ones, they, I don't notice them having like big stands of milkweed. You'll just see them here and there. I mean, you'll see a lot of them, but not, not a big stand where they're choking things out or anything. And the milkweed, again, this is a native plant. And this is the one you probably know if you break it, you know, it has the white uh, latexy material, you know, liquid inside of it. That's actually poisonous, and that's what keeps a lot of insects and plants from eating, or animals from eating it. But uh, it's insects love to pollinate this and and get the the nectar from this. And uh, the monarch butterfly actually uses the milkweed. Its its larvae will eat the milkweed leaves, so uh, it's good for the monarch. Um, 
And the, the milkweed is the one that has the seeds that kind of float in the air, you know, almost like a dandelion or something. There's another skipper up here on the, on the milkweed flower. I also noticed a lot of flies on those milkweeds too. They maybe are also pollinating. So um, I'm gonna show several vines, but uh, not together. So this is the river grape, the riverbank grape. And you can see from that video that it just covered all the bushes in that one stretch. It's, it, it can actually be quite, uh, <laughs> quite aggressive. It's, it's almost like seeing kudzu down in North Carolina or something. Um, now, of course, it's, it's good for the animals because, uh, of course, it's providing the, the fruit um, that birds and stuff will eat. And also you can see that it provides a really nice cover for a lot of uh, animals. They can get up under there and, and uh, be protected and, and maybe have nesting. Uh, but there are some plants that suffer as a result of it. And so I'm going to show you here the, um, the buckthorn, not, well, for two reasons. One is because it is an attractive plant. It has these uh, berries uh, that are nice, but you can also see it struggling to get, <laughs> to f fight its way out of this uh, grape canopy. And you see all this is grape vines, you know? And it's just covering this buckthorn. Um, and the, the grape vine, by the way, is very, very cold hardy. I mean, like super cold hardy. Oh, I just wanted to give you one, one demonstration of how it can cover a tree. So that tree's can be, and I've seen some where it's snaked its way up like 40 feet into a tree. Maybe not in that case covering the tree, but in this case, the entire tree got covered. Uh, so another native plant, and this one's a, kind of a favorite, is the button bush. Um, grows right along the water, but, but not in the water, but right, right up along the water. And these are a couple of examples. And this is what it looks like up close. So you can see how striking it is. And here's one that hasn't you know, opened up, and then here's one that has. So you get a good demonstration of a two for one there. Um, and the bees love this. I really, all the insects do. In fact, I wanna, I wanna freeze this. I wonder if I can do that. Can I? No, I can't. Oh, darn it. I wanted to freeze this first one. Well, is that frozen? Yeah. Yeah. So. This is interesting for one reason. There's actually three insects on this one. There's a, there's a ladybug somewhere up there, although that's not it. That's just some piece of the plant. And of course the bumblebee. And then there's this guy, and I don't know, most people they see that and they say, oh, it's a bee. That's actually a fly that looks like a bee, uh, I suppose for, for predatory reasons. Uh, but that's, you know, similar to like a house fly, only it's a surfed fly, it's a different, species and all, but, um, and again, you'll see a ladybug in that picture. There it goes. <laughs> and the uh, bumblebees. So I really like the button bush. Now the button bush, uh, it's, mallards will use that for nesting, but also, if some of you saw my post a few, several weeks ago, a couple of months ago, maybe now, I guess, uh, I was paddling along the river and uh, saw a branch sticking out over the river and it had a nest on it, but you know, sitting in my kayak, the nest was like here. So I could only stick my camera up like that, you know, <laughs> without bothering it. And when you looked in the picture, it did have two baby birds. They were quite big, but they were kind of laying flat and sort of covering themselves. And I didn't know what, what kind of bird it was. And then uh, I think it was the next day I went back and got chased off by Eastern Kingbirds. So I know what kind of bird it was. <laughs> so apparently Eastern Kingbirds will also put their nest in a button bush. <laughs> um, oh, and the button bush is a larval host to some of the uh, moth species. 
ducks will eat the fruit, wild, wild uh, waterfowl. Um, and insects and hummingbirds will use that nectar. I actually saw, I, you know, I don't usually see hummingbirds out there, and I saw one the other day out in the back channels. It wasn't on a, it wasn't on a button bush. It was actually on a pickerel weed, but still, that was fun to see one there. I mean, I see them at my house all the time, but I don't see them out on the river very much. So swamp azalea, this is very much like your azaleas at home. Uh, and again, it grows up, you know, on the banks, but close to the water. Oh, and here's a little photo bombing in here. I, don't, I didn't include this as part of the talk, but there's some, uh, some skunk cabbage, which is literally the first plant I see when I go out in the spring. That's, and, uh, but yet they still hang around. Um, I don't have any pictures of them. That, just, that guy just happened to insert himself. So uh, quite long stamen and really pretty flowers on these uh, swamp azaleas. They, uh, they are native. But they also are poisonous. So. Uh, and the wildlife don't really uh, have that much use for the azalea, interestingly. Uh, the next one's also very striking, uh, especially in the winter. That's the winter berry in the holly family. Again, uh, you'll see them up on the bank usually. Uh, this one's surprisingly uh, close to the water. I usually see them a little bit further back. Um, is that the berry that turns white? I don't know. Could be. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else know that one? Uh, the berries were used by natives for um, medicinal purposes, although I don't know exactly what they used them for. And birds will eat those berries. Probably wax wings, if I had to guess. Um, Okay, so this is another one with berries that's interesting. It's kind of a bluish, blackish, purplish berry, uh, and it's called the uh, arrowwood. I don't know if this is southern or northern arrowwood. It looks more like southern from the pictures, but uh, one would sort of think intuitively it'd be the northern. <laughs> um, it is part of the viburnum family. Again, native plant, and it, it, it will get eaten by some insects and, berry, and birds will eat those berries. Um, this is one I see periodically. It's not, not a dominant plant by any means, and neither have been any of the last several I've talked about. Uh, but I'll see these along the river here and there, and these are like a wild sort of swamp rose. Uh, I believe this is two different um, Two different species. Uh, the I think the white one is the Rosa multiflora, and the and the pink one is the Rosa palustris. Uh, and animals will actually eat the rose hips, but otherwise I don't think they're really much use to the animals. Now these are kind of fun. So that here we're back into the vines. Um, this is the nightshade, and this is the climbing nightshade. Now there are a, a number of nightshades, and apparently the the black nightshade, the uh, that's the deadly one. The, that's the one that's super poisonous. But this is also poisonous, and it uh, it contains uh, solanine and uh, and um, dulcamarine. But the, I think the fun thing about this is so these purple flowers are quite. Um, characteristic. You'll see those purple flowers right away and you'll know, oh yeah, I got some nightshade. But if you look at these leaves, they do kind of look like tomato plants a little bit. So this is a tomato native, I mean a relative. So tomatoes, potatoes, and eggplant are all in the same family with the nightshade. Kind of fun. Uh, and so there's the berries on the right. Uh, if you notice the berries uh, both in that picture and this picture are green, they're the unripe berries, and that's the most poisonous of all the part of the plant, is the unripe green berries. The berries on the right, of course, those are maybe the size of a blueberry or smaller, but, but that's how it, that kind of looks a little more like a tomato that way, because <laughs> it's red. Uh, this one, when I first saw it. When you say poisonous, does that mean you, you don't uh, grab them or you don't eat them? Don't eat them. But you can grab them anyway. Probably, I would think so. 
I mean, depending on what you do. <laughs> I think if, if you accidentally grab that, I don't think you're hurting yourself. And even this, I think this form of nightshade, even if you eat it, I think you probably have to eat a lot for, for humans to be killed, you know. Um, whereas that other form, the black nightshade, uh, I don't know what its habitat is. It's not out on the river, but it's much more poisonous than this one. Um, this plant, when I first saw it, of course, it looks like morning glory. It's in the morning glory family. And then uh, I thought it was this bindweed, which apparently is like a super, uh, like top 10 pest in the, you know. But this is not actually the bindweed they're talking about. This is the hedge false bindweed. It's a completely different genus. Um, so when I see it out there, you know, I'll see them here and there. It's not like a big, you know, whereas they're, when they're talking about those pests, they can cover everything, I guess. Uh, so I believe this is the, um, this is the, uh, the hedge false bindweed and, and it's, it, it's hard to tell the difference between the different ones, but I think this one is Calistegia sylvatica. And the reason I think that is because they said that, hmm, I thought I had a picture of it. Well... Anyhow, there's a way you can tell at the base of the flower the way the thing goes, and I, so I'm, I believe that's the one we're looking at here. And you know, you, you will see it, uh, actually even, like you, you notice the picture on the left there, it's wrapped itself around a weak grass. <laughs> it's just sort of fallen into the, into the water, but it seems to be able to tolerate the water uh, without much problem. Now, this is also a toxic plant. Uh, okay, so the last thing. Trees. I'm not going to talk about any trees. Uh, but by far, the two most dominant trees along the river are the red maple and the white pine. By far. I mean, I can list you another half dozen trees that you'll see, but not like these. The red maple has a very, very shallow root system. If you, if you walk along the... the rail trail and and you know the swampy areas there you'll always seeing them fall over and these giant root balls sticking up in the air because they just fell over because you know they're in the swamp and they have a super shallow root ball but but very wide um you'll see them right in the water sometimes i mean they're just the there's red maple just thrives out in the river uh you can tell the red maple, if you're ever trying to look at, you look at different maples and you're like, oh, how do I know it's a red maple? I mean, forget the, this red part. <laughs> the leaf is almost always a three-lobed leaf. So, you know, it's a jer, 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 that's it. Now you've seen the, the Canadians, you know, with the sugar maple, that's always a five-lobed. And the five lobes are very prominent. Sometimes you'll see a, you know, a small, fifth lobes on here, but they're not prominent. So you know if it's three dominant lobes on the leaf, it's, it's most likely a red maple. This is in the spring. You can see the uh, red maple seeds uh, sometimes can be quite uh, attractive. And then of course, in the fall, they're, they're what makes all the color on the river. So you, you can see how much, how much the maple dominates the shore just by the fact that, look at it, it's all color. And then the only thing that's not color is a white pine yeah. <laughs> over on the end. So that's, that's the dominant trees. Obviously you'll get, you'll get the, occasion, <coughs> the occasional willow and you'll get the uh, occasional types of oaks, but they're not all over the place like these guys are. So that's it. Came in right at two o'clock. Oh, almost. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>